This is a podcast from The Bugle. Out of the ocean they march, serried ranks of scaled men clad in exoskeletons of shell, curved whalebone flags slung over their shoulders. They're eerily silent apart from the surprisingly loud collective drip of water onto sand from a thousand slowly drying bodies like rain in summer and the gurgle of their ocean-filled water-breathing tanks. It is impossible to tell whether they're a threat or an invitation. Nobody's drawn a weapon, they just stand there, still and multitudinous, waiting for a signal. Nobody knows to meet them, they're unannounced. A small family down by the shore for a morning dip sits frozen mid-sandcastle, ignored. The father draws his arms around his children and whispers, It's the gargle. (laughs) Yeah, this is the gargle, the sonic glossy magazine to the Bugle's audio newspaper for a visual world. I'm your host, Alice Fraser, and your guest editors for this week's edition of the magazine are Tiff Stevenson. Welcome back. Hello, hi. Nice to be here. It's one of the funny things with podcasting. Where you're nice to be here, where it's the same place where you normally are. <laughs> Cast here. Nice to be room in the in corner <laughs> of my living room. And Alison Spittle. Pew, pew, pew. Hello. I am in my sitting room as well. Um, and I live in a new place. Uh, my downstairs neighbours, I've never met them before, but they enjoy TV 12 hours a day at quite a loud volume. So, uh, I've covered my, I can, like, because I watch Pointless every day at the same time, but I pause it because I'm not a pervert, you know, I like to, I like to pause it and work out stuff and then play it again, and then I can hear, they're also Pointless people too, so they can't be all bad, you know what I mean, at least they're not Chase watchers, but I can hear the cadence of it, you know, just below, and it freaks me out, so I'm here with uh, my floor covered in cushions, because I hear that soundproofing. I'll show it to you because you got it on video here. It's the gargle. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, hopefully that's worked. Before we take hands and leap together into the soft play area that is this week's top stories, let's have a look at the front cover of the magazine. The front cover this week is Britney Spears posing provocatively with a quarter of a century of provocative poses and the horrifying backstories that will make you feel ashamed for liking or disliking her music and public persona in the past. Uh, Alison, have you been tracking this exciting news? Oh, I've been uh, I've been listening to the audiobook. I've been reading all the tweets. Uh, free Britney once again, and she's freeing herself through uh, her book. I um I do have an obsession with pop people who I feel are trapped by uh larger larger companies at hand. I'm a big pop conspiracy theorist, do you know what I mean? Like I genuinely am. Um and uh yeah, I'm really, really happy that once again Justin Timberlake is getting in the neck. <laughs> I feel like every year there's a reckoning <laughs> where people are like, Oh my god, Justin Timberlake's a dickhead and I've been like, I've been saying this the whole time, you know. <laughs> but uh, every year we get reminded. So it's been beautiful yeah it's been great was there any mention of the the knife dancing not yet i I need to get to the later chapters but yeah the knife dancing um was it representative of the fact she wasn't allowed near knives or something or she had sharp objects taken away from her do you know what reclaiming that sometimes it's it's the way sometimes i put batteries in my mouth i thought it was just sometimes you just don't think about and you're just like oh this looks like fun i'll just dance with a knife (laughs) pretend i'm in beauty and the beast or whatever you know uh i did yeah (laughs) (laughs) do you not do that sometimes um so like i i'd like to see what she has to say about the knife dancing but in my head i just presume that sometimes you just want to dance with a knife you know yeah, it's one of those things that if uh, if you're just a cool dude with like a scar over one eye, no one questions dancing with a knife. <laughs> yes! <laughs> yeah. It's the sexism in, in the pop industry. <laughs> yes. If you have an eye patch and a parrot on your shoulder. <laughs> it's not all swashbuckling, just knife dancing from a certain perspective. Uh, the satirical cartoon this week is cultural icon and maverick billionaire Elon Musk claiming he would give Wikipedia a billion dollars if they changed their name to Dickopedia, a joke that I would write off as the lowest form of satire, which is where someone says the name of someone they don't like wrong, yeah. and also in an annoying voice like they're bullying them in primary school. Uh, I, I would write it off as a joke, except uh, with people who have billions of dollars, not enough of which they spend on no men, these kinds of impulsive jokes directed at news and information platforms can turn into whatever the f*** Twitter is now. I feel 
all billionaires have to own at least one and ruin at least one newspaper. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> and, yeah, I applaud Elon for going straight to the source of Twitter and now Wikipedia to, to own and yes. ruin. Yes, not a newspaper, a media source. <laughs> They're like puppies. You know, they just piss all over newspapers. It's very common. Um, so, you know, if you said that in a serious tone, by the way, Alice, that he would change into Wikipedia, I would believe you. You know what I mean? That, that's like uh, look, Elon I Musk. don't know what tone he used, but he definitely did say that. That is the kind of satire that is me just saying the thing that has actually happened in real life. Oh, mate. Soz. Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh my God. <laughs> I'm such a case. I was like, Alice has got it so on the point here. She's really got him. <laughs> and it's like, no, it's him. <laughs> it's just, just what he wants just to do. Just him. Just his own words. <laughs> just just his own words, his, his own petard, if you will. Which brings us to our top story. Our top story this week is evolution news. And this is the exciting news um, that a very long-held evolutionary theory that men were evolved almost exclusively for hunting and women evolved for gathering um, has been debunked by science and looking at skeletons and actual archaeology. Um, rather than superimposing our ideas of how things ought to be on the world. Uh, Tiff Stevenson, uh, you know some hunters and gatherers. Can you unpack this story for us? <laughs> okay, so um, it says that there's mounting evidence from exercise science that indicates women are physiologically better suited than men to endurance efforts such as running marathons. This advantage bears on questions about hunting because a prominent hypothesis contends early humans are thought to have pursued prey on foot over long distances until the animals were exhausted. Furthermore, the fossil and archaeological records, as well as ethnographic studies of modern-day hunter-gatherers, indicate that women have a long history of hunting game. So um, so proponents of the man the hunter theory, which is what they talk about it as, men being the meat winners, which then evolved into modern day breadwinner, winner wow. of the bread. Mm. I, I'm already a winner of Scottish plain, uh, <laughs> which is which is a type of bread in Scotland. And also what I nicknamed my husband. He's far from plain. Um, but uh, yes, that, that um, they, the man the hunter theory assumed evolution was acting prim primarily on men and women were merely passive beneficiaries of both the meat supply and evolutionary progress i've not known this theory i always thought and maybe i read it in people's history of the world but i always thought we hunted as teams mm. um but just one half of the team had more skills than the other like and i always used to use that as a rebuttal as to why women couldn't do comedy because you know using that hunter gatherer explanation is that men were sp supposedly faster but women would often spot the prey and observe the land. So they were the observers. So the idea that women can't do observational comedy is a joke to me because <laughs> women are, we're, we're observers. Like if, you, if you've ever argued with a woman, a woman, you know, <laughs> women who see everything, hear everything, remember everything. So, so I think what this is saying is that women also hunted. Uh, well, as far as I knew, women also hunted, but they were slower because they carried the baby. So I thought it was like historical Ginger Rogers just doing everything that Gene Kelly did, but backwards and in high heels. <laughs> so they were still hunting. Um, you know, they were just a, a bit slower at the hunting, as is what I thought. It's super interesting because I think uh, the evolutionary uh, theories that I grew up with were, first of all, that like meat has more calories than vegetable stuff and so men were the calorie winners. And then it became obvious from the fossil record and from archaeology that actually eight, about 80% of a hunter-gatherer diet was from the gathered stuff mm. uh, because meat is actually pretty hard to get. It's very hard to uh, chase an antelope until it decides to give up and die. Um, and and also fairly dangerous. And so over that period of time, it shifted towards then, oh, actually men might have done some of the gathering uh, because the men who were doing this research were quite attached to the idea of themselves as as, as being the difference between life and death. And uh, now it looks like actually it was all pretty interchangeable. If you were a good runner, you would probably be a hunter. And if you were good at fiddling with things, you might have been a gatherer. And uh, gender might not have necessarily played that much into it except as you say probably if you'd just had a baby you're not up for a marathon mm -hmm. um but uh <laughs> I, I think it's fascinating or you're it's doing the marathon and and taking the baby like if, if you have to keep moving if you're part of a nomadic kind of people that are like if you have to keep moving then you just got to move with the baby 
So we just it is literally doing it all, doing everything Gene Kelly does, backwards in well, high heels. <laughs> it's super fascinating because on one hand, it doesn't matter. It all already happened, no matter how it happened. And nothing <laughs> that you can do or say now makes a difference to what actually happened. But on the other hand, it like these kind of theories reflect so much about what we believe about ourselves now. Uh, and I've saw I've seen some really angry reactions to this. Basically, people saying, "How dare you suggest that women have hunted?" Because it, they're in their narrative of the world, women are not evolved to. Uh, exhaust an antelope to death and that's that's the job of a man is to just to wear someone down until they give up um (laughs) i'm beginning to see where yeah where the dating (laughs) yeah where this has come from like well you keep asking she she keeps saying no she'll say yes eventually (laughs) yeah but, but I feel we, we need to kind of help these men work towards a more kind of uh, historically consistent view of the world and just be like, who do you think would be best at nagging a gazelle to death? Uh, and then <laughs> yes. we can claim our rightful place in anthropological history. Um, well, this, this article says women were better over long distance as well, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, the, the women hold the current ultramarathon um, champion. Ship. Yes. Isn't that because of estrogen? Isn't it like estrogen is like uh, they 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 were comparing testosterone and estrogen, and testosterone is like talked up quite a lot uh, in exercise, but estrogen as a hormone kind of helps you uh, do stuff for longer. Also, like uh, this was really interesting to me because my o- my only knowledge of uh, cavemen behavior was uh, the Flintstones before. <laughs> and uh, I was trying to think of like a, a Flintstones gender reveal party, like what dinosaur or would be used within that. You know the way you, these have like a dinosaur that was a bin. Like how would Fred Flintstone <laughs> do a gender reveal party? <laughs> <laughs> and what kind of japes would go wrong? Uh, and it's just, uh, it's also like the Flintstones came out in the 60s and this theory came out in the 60s as well. So this, these were, I the think. Man, the hunter theory. Yeah, the hunter theory. Yeah, and it's so strange because it feels like the, the, the sexual revolution was happening. And then all of a sudden this theory came out that actually men are responsible for uh for humankind continuing uh with the by hunting and it does it does feel like this you know it feels like a kind of it feels very pointed that's all i'm trying to say well around the same time they had was it the 60s where they had the the female orgasm is a myth Oh, yes. You know, so I think... Have, a lot have we of this, told like, some male of... comedians that still? Because I think <laughs> they believe that. Like, the amount of stand-up I've had to listen to where it's just been like, I can't make a woman come, and that's okay. You know, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> and that's not my problem. Yeah. <laughs> I can't make a woman cut, and that's not my problem. <laughs> that's yeah. a, that's a you problem. That's, yeah. Just somebody uh, levering themselves off and going, "I thought you were a feminist. Aren't you meant to be empowered?" Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can't have it all. You know? <laughs> if you want to get a job done, do it yourself. <laughs> Your ad section now, because you can't be what you can't buy. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by ferns. Ferns, the dinosaurs of plants. Ferns, why evolve? Ferns, <laughs> they're in your house looking down on your evolutionary optimization. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and this episode of the podcast is brought to you by the human bottom. The human bottom, a couch cushion you don't need to pat into shape, travels with you wherever you go. Bottoms, we've got your back. <laughs> And this episode of the podcast is brought to you by Fast Meals, an all-in-one meal kit that takes all the hassle out of fasting for the busy self-builder. Whether you're body conscious, desperately chasing longevity, or in the midst of a religious penance, you need to fast. But it can be so complicated to think about what skipping each meal involves. Bringing you Fast Meals. All our meals are vegetarian, vegan, gluten, and dairy-free because there's nothing in them. Each week, a kit arrives, and each skipped meal is provided with pre-measured ingredients. Prevent food waste with fast meals. Mm. Each meal replacement is a perfectly pre-proportioned half a glass of water. (laughs) (laughs) 
And now it's time for property news. Uh, This is uh, the property news that landlords are going on social media basically talking about evicting single mothers, old people, uh, people who are desperately ill and seeking help and kind of cackling about it, playing into kind of a villain trope as though they were proud of it. Alison Spittle, you've just moved house. Can you unpack this story for us? Yes, it feels like we're back in Dickensian times, uh, except uh, people do dance routines while evicting people. And I am... <laughs> TikToked Dickens. Yeah. <laughs> Little Dick Dorrit has Don't got look a that dab. Up. That's a different thing. TikTok, yeah, that's great. That's great. So this, um, this is about like uh, landlords in America um, who are uh, going on TikTok and talking about evicting people um, uh, as if it's a, like as if it's a part of sorry it's it's, it's kind of like landlords talking about uh, eviction without any shame uh, that that's the that's what the news is about it's about this uh, it's about this guy on TikTok his name is Tom Cruise uh, no relation. Uh, to <laughs> to the actor, maybe but... a, re- a relation to Ted Cruz. <laughs> yeah, it could be, could be a relation to Ted Cruz. But um, he talks about um, kicking out a single mother, and uh, it's it, it. This this article is about other landlords who uh, make themselves kind of villainous on uh, on social media. Um, they they're either villainous or they're trying to encourage other people to uh, become landlords. I've seen I've seen a lot of landlord stuff on uh, on TikTok. Um, and like you know, I've I've had landlords for about how many years now? I'd say about eighteen years. I've seen one landlord who who when I said I had a mold problem came round in a in like a really nice suit and cleaned out the mold himself like destroying his own suit like landlords are dumb <laughs> they are they are not clever people you know uh, think think about monopoly right it, is it is it the cleverest person in your family that wins monopoly no <laughs> it's the most untrustworthy shit weasel in your family the type of family member where you wouldn't leave a spare mobile phone in front of and leave the room for 10 minutes you know that type of one so like uh, yeah <laughs> I do you know what it's very risky me to say this because I still rely on landlords for shelter. So of course to my to my current landlord, not you, you're great. <laughs> um, but the rest, um, so yeah, it, it it's it's um it's a very odd kind of article because it's very neutral. When I was reading it, I kept like there was this like big thing in my head going guillotine 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 <laughs> like they are genuinely they 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 offer no skills landlords there's no skills they see it as a job it's not a job you know it's just uh uh wait i'm, I'm, I'm wait there i'm getting too rageful Well, it feels like this is a backlash to the trend on particularly on social media that arose particularly during COVID when people had a minute to think, wait a minute, society isn't uh, geared in my favour. I wonder why not. Uh, It feels like there was a lot of anti-landlord stuff going around that people were you know pointing out for example that it's not a real job or um saying things like oh if you scalp tickets if you buy tickets and then sell them at a markup that's illegal but if you do it with real estate uh, that's perfectly acceptable and so it feels like this is the landlords trying to fight back trying to take hold of the narrative <laughs> but they've taken hold of the narrative essentially by tying a young lady some train tracks and saying isn't my waxed mustache debonair um, <laughs> yeah it, it just... feels like they're sort of leaning into the to the empire side of this narrative i think landlords are very affected by the mental health crisis at the moment because like i've never seen an industry so susceptible to peer pressure in my life like my <laughs> landlord last year was like i have to raise the rent everyone else is raising the rent that's essentially what the markets is the euphemism of the markets it doesn't mean like they need more money it's like they can get more money other people in their industry are getting more money therefore they can get it too but it doesn't you know lots of landlords have their mortgages paid off it's bullshit and they just put the money you know if if interest rates go up it's always the uh renter the, the renter never gets a break and i'm sick of it yeah uh, the, yeah the market dictates which is such a great phrase because i imagine the market 
sitting down and going, okay, have you got a notebook? Write this down. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's if you want to feel really depressed about life, and why wouldn't you? You're listening to the gargle. Uh, if you want to feel really depressed about life, look at, look up how much of the current inflation uh, in prices of uh, consumer products is just companies going, oh, inflation's about to happen. Let's put our prices up really? for fun. Uh, yeah. Well, not it, for fun, obviously. <laughs> for profit. They don't do fun. They're capitalism. <laughs> They sell fun. This guy is purposefully going out of his way, though, I think, to be, like, um, uh, provocative and confrontational because he says in one of his videos, guys, there's nobody protecting... uh, There's nobody protected in my portfolio, the elderly, the disabled, the single mums. So this guy deals solely in... This this Ted... Ted Cruz. (laughs) Tom Cruz guy. Deals solely in Section 8 um, housing, which is welfare you know, partially subsidised by the government. So he specifically is looking for people who are uh, vulnerable or down on their luck or looking for work or whatever else. And and gets it. he's got something like 650 homes across four states in the south and the mid midwest. And um, guillotine, yeah. guillotine, kill, kill, kill. <laughs> So I blame RuPaul's Drag Race for this. <laughs> really? <laughs> or reality television as a whole for teaching the the general public that you can uh, become iconic by being a villain. Um, yeah. That all you need to be is memorable. And so <laughs> there's no incentive to be, like, nice anymore. You just need to... Who decided that, um, that you know, reality reality shows or that, that real estate people, estate agents and landlords are the people we should give reality shows to. And now that yes. they've in the influencer you know you've got selling sunset which i am obsessed with and i think it's because i don't own a property so i may as well watch these people and the 20 million pound mansions uh because that doesn't feel like reality <laughs> like it feels like but if you don't know selling sunset the storyline is two tiny bald men surrounded by giant women yes that's pretty much <laughs> That's the storyline. And you have like Heather and Chriselle and Maya and Davina and Mary and Heather and Heather and Chriselle. Oh, Maya is my favorite. Um, if, you, if, you, if you're listening and you watch Selling Sunset, uh, Maya is the one who's like, Jason, I would like to go to Miami and sell some luxury apartments. Um, and her main storyline is being pregnant across the five seasons. And then there's Mary, whose husband appeared for the first two series and then just disappeared. And I think she's eaten him. I don't know. <laughs> she looks very young, so maybe, you know, she's ingested. Maybe she's Brian Johnson to him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've started watching van life videos on YouTube as an aspirational method now of living because I don't think I'll ever own a house, but I think if I work hard enough, I could own a van. You know what I mean? And just put a mattress in it <laughs> and life's a good one. And uh, like, it's very like, I've, I've, st- like, I've started watching van life videos and it's kind of, it's a it's a very scary kind of prospect because I don't feel safe in my house. How would I feel safe in a van? <laughs> you know what? It just feels it 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 it, it yeah. It just feels wrong. I don't know. I, I've no ending to that. Actually, I should. That's just grim. I feel sad now. <laughs> I feel like excited and bloodlusty over the landlords. I think there's a stress to owning a home or even living in a home that would be doubled by the idea that you could crash your home. <laughs> yeah but you know what at least i'd be able to put a nail in a wall and stick up a picture without worrying about a deposit do you know what i mean like my last landlord took a picture of behind the oven to try and like take away my deposit to go like look yeah. at behind the oven and it's like was it clean when i got the-? it's just i just i just yeah that I- bit behind the oven where everyone goes to have a look that requires me i'm <laughs> plumbing the oven to to go and clean behind it. I think what you have to do now is you have to watch horror films. This is what I do. And we're in spooky season. You've got to watch horror films like they're property renovation shows. And then the horror films make a lot more sense. Like, you know, there's blood running down the walls. Yeah, that's what happens if you try and dry clothes with the windows closed at the same time. <laughs> um, the taps keep turning on and off. The doors are creaky. Um, we just need some WD-40 on those and an exorcism. And uh, this old bitch is literally haunting the place because her property in the next life is part of a chain. So we can't get out <laughs> until until someone in the spirit world sells their property. But uh, yeah, it's it feels... Sometimes it feels like so far away and I don't know whether that's part of being in London to kind of, um, it's becoming, 
seemingly impossible. It seems like more and more, especially in London, more and more people are like renting now and not buying properties, but fewer people own the properties. Mm, that's it. On the bright side, Alison, if you are in a van and your downstairs neighbours are playing pointless too loudly, <laughs> you know you've found the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. That's it. There. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's time for your reviews. As you know, each week we ask our guest editors to bring in something to review out of five stars. Uh, Tiff, what have you brought in for us this week? Oh, what am I going to review this week? I think I'm going to review Fake Tan. Um, because um, you know last week I went for a spray tan and I feel like it's still developing um, well I'm developing as a human and the tan um, I don't know when it's going to stop Though I think the worst part of having a, a spray tan is when they say can you lift your boobs so I can spray underneath and then you have a little cry and then that streaks all the tan on your face I like the idea of um, of feeling like it's summer all year round um, but the reality is I end up with like a kind of like like true and shroud on my sheets of just I like, get you yeah. <laughs> like fake t- is there Jesus in my fake tan I've had a professional fake tan once and I felt like a driveway that was being cleaned do you know it felt satisfying <laughs> yeah. I mean it just spray you and I'm like yes like a pressure yeah like like a pressure hose yeah yeah I would love to be pressure hosed I, I mean that is essentially water cannon maybe uh, yeah. maybe in a few weeks when I protest I'll get I'll, I'll regret those words but at the moment I'd love to be pressure hosed you know I'm, I'm, a, I'm gonna say spray tan like three out of five I like the results but I don't like the admin I don't like the other I don't like the side effects which are the sheets and the interacting with a with another human who asked me to lift up my boobs. I don't know if this is like confessing to a deep lack of fe- uh, of femininity or something, but I've never had a fake tan. Um, you've, so I feel like I've, I've missed out on a like a coming of age kind of experience. <laughs> yeah, you need to get into ballroom dancing. You'll have to have one like <laughs> daily for that. Competitive ballroom dancing or anything. You know, sometimes it's it's sort of mad, isn't it? I sometimes have it for, you know, a TV recording or something because studio lights are so strong and absolutely blast you that actually just to kind of look like normal on screen. Mm. <laughs> like, oh, um, that's yeah. That's so maybe this it. is it. My lack of television uh, credits <laughs> means that I've never had <laughs> to have a fake tan. You've I had, always assumed you've... it was for like bold ballroom dancing. And then uh, it's just so that because as far as I can tell from all these dancing shows, they end up having affairs with their dance partners. So it's just that, you know, whose sheets, who's been in. Yes. Yeah. You're, you're rubbing tan off on each other infinite, <laughs> infinitely. You never need to get it topped up. Ripping <laughs> off each other's paper knickers from the tan <laughs> itself. You know. Yeah, see, Alice, you've never suffered the indignity of paper knickers. All those little eye things that you put on, they give you these little like foil things and you bend them and pop them into your... Oh, yeah. You get as much of your face sprayed as possible. So, you know there's fun there's you're, you're missing out alice there's fun stuff well she could just put a covid mask on her on her fanny and that would be the equivalent of the paper <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, just put your two legs hole. into the ear holes <laughs> uh alison what have you brought in to review this week i brought in to review i regret now not going up with like a thing uh, there's this book i really like uh called uh, reach for the stars by Michael Craig, which is a history of uh, pop music from the late 90s to early 2000s. And because I'm reading the Britney Spears book at the moment, it's made me, reminded me of how much I I love that book and it came out this year. And uh, I just want to say, I think Simon Fuller, who used to be the manager of the Spice Girls and S Club 7, should be in The Hague for war crimes. Genuinely, there should be some sort of UN human rights uh, uh, kind of... um, uh, investigation into the way that people were treated uh, in the late 90s. I remember once I read Smash Hits and they asked Rachel Stevens for some nutritional advice and uh, she said that she would eat uh, two spoonfuls of beans, cold baked beans for a protein hit and uh, that made me stop wanting to be a pop star. I thought <laughs> like if that's the life that you have that you would publicly say that you like eating cold beans out of half a can. That is not a life well lived. So I'm going to give it five stars out of five. It's an incredible book. Genuinely gives a history of like uh, 
loads of stuff and it's like mostly working class people as well that were pop stars not nowadays where like they're the sons and daughters of someone of a I'm, I'm getting angry again it's this <laughs> it's landlordism or it's nepo babies in pop music and I gotta, stop. I gotta stop I feel I feel like if you're treating uh, two spoonfuls of beans like a heroin hit you need to at least heat up those beans with a lighter underneath <laughs> <the spoon. laughs> Chase the flatulence. Yeah. <laughs> that would be amazing. And I'm sorry, but like, you know, this podcast is a very big proponent of uh, half a half a glass of water, half a tin of beans. It's a more grimmer, you know, that that's the Rachel Stevens equivalent of Alice Fraser. It's half a tin of beans. Uh, do you think that was given to her to say, or do you think that's a genuine... I think what, ge- like, genuinely what I think happened is that they probably, when they said nutritional advice off pop stars, they looked for, like, when pop stars talked about food. Do you right, know what I mean? Right, I'd right. say that was it. I don't think Rachel Stevens rang up Smash It's and goes, guys, have you heard of uh, two spoonfuls of beans? <laughs> like, that's a cry for help. <laughs> that's like... <laughs> Calls up the Sun Press office. I got, I got an exclusive for you. Two, two spoonfuls of beans. Very satisfactory. And not sad at all. And that brings us to Amish news now. And a number of Amish men have been shunned from their communities, shunned by their communities, uh, after a an emergency alert test uh, revealed their secret mobile phones. Uh, Alison Spittle, you have at least five secret mobile phones. Can you unpack this story for us? Oh, and so many crevices. So um, <laughs> in the US, uh, it was a similar thing to what happened in the UK earlier this year. Uh, basically, uh, all phones uh, were, were uh, set off an alarm. Uh, it was a practice run for when shit goes really bad. Although shit is pretty bad right now. I, I'm like... I'm thinking, what kind of cataclysmic event is gonna is gonna need uh, these phones to go off? But um, in the Amish community, it is kind of frowned upon to have a uh, modern uh, modern stuff like mobile phones, and, and uh, some Amish people were keeping secret mobile phones. Uh, that's because they wanted to be upstanding in their community, but also play Wordle at the same time. You know, these were the types of people that were doing that, and. Uh, because the alarm went off, uh, lots of discoveries were made of people in the Amish community with secret mobile phones. And there has been some shunnings, according to a fellow on TikTok. So it's interesting because like, uh, I was reading this article and it says there's there's many different types of shunnings. Shunnings to me <laughs> seems like a very old style version of cancel culture. It's like, you know, <laughs> the Amish, they're able to make their own butter and also they're able to cancel in real time too. And uh, one of the one of the ways that they've uh, they, they shun, right, is uh, if when visiting your Amish family, and you want to serve a glass of water to your parents, you must leave it on the table for one of your younger siblings to give it to your parents. You're not allowed to hand your parents a glass of water uh, if you've been shunned, which really makes me think that these people need Candy Crush in their lives. Uh, They have too much (laughs) spare time. That is too much thought that's gone into it. And um, it's, uh, yeah, it's... uh, it's it's very interesting to me this this Amish uh, community because they're very secretive and quiet and I thought about that and I was like that's because they don't have smartphones and they're not showing off their business all the time like if I wanted to know what it's like to work in Starbucks I go onto TikTok and I find out every single detail I know all the recipes I know the shift work I could watch uh, I I do you know what I do watch I watch a guy called Tom the taxi driver who drives around London. And it's just in real time, he's driving around, he talks about, I've never had an interest in being a taxi driver myself, but I find it incredibly compelling and interesting. And, uh, you know, like, so it is, it is uh, maybe, maybe actually they're dead right not to have their phones. The more I talk about this, the more I'm like, maybe I have too much time on my hands. Maybe I should make my own butter, you know, instead of dead scroll, death scrolling. 
So the Amish are against anything that they feel weakens the family structure, and I'm pretty sure uh, that uh, texting at the dinner table does weaken the family structure. It's not to say that uh, the Amish community completely eschews phones. They'll often have, like, a shared phone in a shed that a couple of families uh, will be able to use um, for whatever um, nefarious phone usage purposes they might need to have. Uh, but it's sort of the, the, the home phone and the private phone um are not not permitted, not allowed. Um, Tiff, have you been shunned recently? <laughs> I thought I thought it was an anti-electricity thing. I thought that that's why they didn't have phones. I thought that there was this kind of like more like like that's why you've got horses and carriages um, because they don't believe in you know petrol vehicles and that kind of machinery. Mm. It's like very old-fashioned labour and labour being good for the soul and the heart and that everyone in their very clearly defined roles within the within the community but i could be wrong but uh, what i liked about this story was that there was a double shunning a double double shunning a double shun yeah so i don't know whether that then if you're double shunned does that become unshun oh like Like, is it like a double negative like it cancels it out i don't know one guy says the elders were coming coming in his driveway and they were there to speak to him about something they'd heard about him that he might have to get shunned. We need to wow. come and talk. Like I love the have the grapevine. So they, you know, they don't need uh, Twitter or X. I still can't bring myself to call it that. Um, <laughs> you know, to hear rumours. It's just within the community. And um, he said when that was going on, the alert went off and the phone was in his pocket. And now he's getting shunned for both. Whatever they're about to shun him for, and also the cell phone, the double shun. Amazing. I mean. What a what a life! What a life. <laughs> but but also, how long how long does the shunning last for? Like, there's something about it that maybe in a way is a bit more satisfying within the Amish community because I think uh, you were talking about as a version of being cancelled. But at least with the shunning, I pre- presume it's for a length of time, and it's very mm. specific about what the person's being shunned for. So it's like you get shunned for two weeks, um, no one speaks to you, they're not allowed to communicate with you, and you just have to stew in your own juices for two weeks and then you are unshun and back in the community but it's scary because there's no central kind of governing force there's no and there's no central rules so you are just relying on the most uppity of your community to uh <laughs> to do the shunning and like if you I, i'd say they love shunning like i'd say the people who do shun love it too much do you know right. what i mean yeah yeah because it's a well it, Yes, yeah. Yeah, there there are people who are calling for shunnings on the weekly. Yeah. <laughs> like who are we shunning this week as De- opposed if, to <laughs> If I was Amish, I'd be shunning all around me. I'd be go- going shunning postal so I would I wouldn't talk to anyone. I'd be a hermit. I'd be like you're all shunned. <laughs> <laughs> But then technically you've shunned yourself. Exactly, exactly. And I'd do it again. <laughs> Before turning the shunning against herself, she shunned everybody else. <laughs> yeah, machine shun. Yeah. Shun rights for everyone. Exactly. Out of my cold, dead hands. You know? <laughs> I mean, that is what I'm going to call the block button on Twitter from now on is the machine shun. Um, <laughs> And that brings us to the end of this episode of The Gargle. I'm flipping through the ad section at the back. Uh, Tiff, have you got anything to plug? Uh, I will be plugging um, Catharsis if you want to hear it. We've got lots of episodes, um, so get those into your ears. Also, Old Rope, which is at the Comedy Store, uh, November 13th, I think is the next show. It's the second Monday of the month, and we've got some incredible lineups coming up. Um, uh, uh, and I believe uh, a Zoltzman maybe at some point I'm waiting to find out if that'll be uh, uh, November or December so yeah and also check out Slother House which is streaming on Hulu if you're uh, in America and Paramount UK um, if you like comedy horror films if you like me if you like sloths if you like yeah if you like I funny, do like both of those things stuff so there you go well then you'll enjoy slaughter house so go watch that excellent alison have you got anything to plug oh baby yes i have a tour it's called soup uh it's starting off in uh 
in New Milton and Fairham. And I've looked at my ticket sales today. No sales there. So go buy tickets if you're there because I don't want to start off my tour with no people coming. You'll definitely get some ponies and Do you some think horses. So? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll tell people I know. I don't <laughs> Go know see Alison. Go see me. Um, I'm, I'm touring around in uh, 2024. Uh, go see me in different places. Also, I'm in Westport this Saturday. I'm in uh, Wicklow the next Saturday. And uh, I'm doing a thing called Kilconomics as well, which is the weekend after this, which is good fun. Anyway, that's all the bits I'm doing. I got an email in from my website form, uh, which I maintain because I do like to get the occasional deranged email. Uh, This one says, hi, Alice, or whoever screens these. Mm, Secret, uh, behind the curtain glance. It's me. Uh, My wife is a big fan, and I heard that you have a book out. That said, I can't tell if it's something you've co-written or if Dancy Lagarde is a character or what. Apologies if this is a dumb question. Kind regards, the name. Uh, First of all, it's not a question. You haven't asked a question there. You've just made a, a series of statements um, <laughs> hoping that I will leap into the breach and elucidate uh, I, I, what and who Dancy Lagarde is. I feel uh, there are so many places I could begin to answer that, but nowhere that I could end answering that. I can either send you back to the last post podcast, which is still available if you want to go back to a really weird sci-fi experiment that we ran uh, during the year that was 2020, or uh, you could go, there's a wiki page if you want to look up all of the Dancy Lagarde advertisements or also you can go to unbound.com and buy the Dancy Lagarde reader currently on pre-order there um, and and read the whole book which includes uh, an interview with Dancy Lagarde and uh, a series of other bits and pieces which ought to explain what and who Dancy Lagarde is but probably actually you will uh, read that book and, and, and be none the wiser. I certainly wrote that book and was none the wiser at the end of that. So that's unbound.com and write in Alice Fraser or the Dancy Lagarde reader to buy your copy. If you would like to be a roving reporter for The Gargle, if you see a story that you think would be a, a hilarious part of this podcast, tweet us at Hello Garglers or over on Blue Sky. We are also there at The Gargle, I think. You'll find it. There's only like eight people on Blue Sky. I'm there. Yeah. Come, come along. I'll come along. I'll come along. I'm Alice Fraser. You can find me online at patreon.com slash Alice Fraser. It's one-stop shop for all of my stand-up specials, podcasts, and blogs, as well as my weekly writer's meetings and my Tea with Alice salons. At the moment, you can get all of that for a dollar a month, as well as Twist and Kronos, which are coming out in the next three weeks, which are my last two stand-up specials, will be available there for free. Uh, this is a Bugle podcast and Alice Fraser production. Your editor is Ped Hunter. Your executive producer is Chris Skinner. I'll talk to you again next week. You can listen to other programs from The Bugle, including The Bugle, Catharsis, Tiny Revolutions, Top Stories and The Gargle, wherever you find your podcasts. <laughs>